Welcome everyone to today's webinar. I am Morgan Hafner with Becker's Hospital Review. We will begin today's webinar with a presentation and we'll have time at the end of the hour for a question and answer session. You can submit any questions you have throughout the webinar by typing them into your control panel in the space labeled enter a question for staff and clicking send. We are looking forward to hearing your questions. This session is being recorded and will be available after the event. In about a week following the webinar, we will be sending all registrants a copy of the presentation to the email you use to register. At this time, it is my pleasure to introduce today's presenter. Dr. James Woodson is a board certified emergency physician whose passion is to serve. He is founder of Pulsera and the Alpine Compassion Clinic, which provides free preventative care to those in need in the East Texas community. After completing his emergency medicine specialty training at Carolina's Medical Center, James joined Leading Edge Medical Associates, providing patient care at the Good Shepherd Health System in Longview, Texas area. While practicing, he experienced the communication difficulties we face in healthcare, in diverse settings from rural critical access facilities all the way to major metropolitan tertiary care centers. This experience inspired Dr. Woodson and his team to fund the healthcare communication company, Pulsera, where he currently serves as CEO. Billy Kunkel is a trauma system planner for the Georgia Trauma Commission. He has over 22 years of experience in fire and emergency services. He completed his EMT firefighter training in 1998 obtained his National Paramedic Certification in 2001, and most recently graduated with his MBA in Healthcare Administration. His first career in EMS was in Metro Atlanta in Henry County, where he quickly was promoted through the ranks, ultimately working as captain overseeing EMS operations within the large suburban county. Other highlights are more than a decade as a flight medic and working in Atlanta's Level 1 Pediatric Trauma Center at Children's Healthcare of Atlanta. At this time, I am pleased to turn the floor over to Dr. Woodson to begin today's presentation. Thank you, Morgan. Billy and I are really excited to talk with you guys today about regional communications. So today, let's start with a question. How do you unite a care team around a patient? When I asked that question, most of you could immediately launch into the intimate details of your EMS agency or your hospital. But then when I follow up with another question, how do people in your organization communicate with other providers across your region? People often kind of pause and have to think about it. So today what we're gonna do is we're gonna talk about some common areas where our systems of care break down, specifically the communications uh, and why they often break down. Then we'll circle back around and spend some time looking at how you can unite a care team when team members work for multiple different healthcare organizations. So it's fascinating when you look at the patient journey, how many different healthcare organizations uh, the patient can cross in a very short period of time. Uh, something like a heart attack or a stroke can often go through first responder, a couple of different EMS agencies, and maybe even a couple of different hospitals. And then take a moment and look at all of the archaic communication technologies we patch together and try to use to coordinate this care. So we often think about interoperability. We talk about it all the time, but usually we're focused just on interoperability of data. So one of the things we wanna talk about today is how do we actually focus on interoperability with real-time communications? So I think it's also important for us to look at how we currently solve communication problems in healthcare. So we typically focus on our four walls. So we will provide a solution uh, for our own organization or agency. So EMS will have their solution. Each hospital in a region will have their solution. Uh, and these are fantastic. There's a lot of options out there. Some people still rely on, on phone and, and pagers, et cetera. But a lot of people are using either EHR driven or independent solutions that are even focused on mobile technology. But they're really isolated to within their four walls, within their healthcare system or within their EMS agency. The other thing that we do in regions is we, we realize we're incredibly fragmented. And so we put together different solutions to bridge a couple of different silos. So one example would be the pre-hospital space. So communicating from EMS to the hospital, 
traditionally what we've done is you get something like a radio or a phone and a medic will call report to somebody at the hospital that's never going to take care of the patient. Uh, we also have some solutions that are popping up that are focused on uh, electronic pre-hospital notifications. A lot of those are more isolated again to uh, basically just getting the communication to the hospital. They don't really communicate very well with downstream team members. Uh, sometimes we're also looking at uh, EPCRs to move data across uh, between the EMS agency uh, to the hospital. But keep in mind that medics often have 24 hours to, uh, to complete their report. So oftentimes that data is not available. So we have to leave a short form in hopes that people downstream at the hospital will be able to find it. So other examples of bridging two silos might be the inter-facility space. So from a rural facility or a spoke facility to a hub, there's two basic things that we typically do when we're trying to solve this, this communication problem. One is we put a transfer center as a middleman, uh, which oftentimes what we do, we have a great streamlined one phone number to call to the transfer center, but then we often make the providers uh, at the spoke facility sit on hold while we find the correct individual at the hub uh, to basically arrange a conversation. And it's typically isolated by phone. Uh, other solutions out there are telemedicine solutions that will uh, are typically disease specific. A lot of them are either uh, just stroke specific or ICU specific. A lot of them are really limited uh, by the fact of uh, they can't cross multiple different healthcare entities super easily. Uh, and so we often will patch together all of these different solutions in a region, whether it's our individual solution, a pre-hospital solution, a couple of different options for uh, inter-facility solutions when the patient journey will actually frequently take them through multiple different healthcare organizations in a very short period of time. So the question would be, wouldn't it be great if there's a solution that could unite all care team members? Simply create a channel, build a team, and communicate. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Billy and get his perspective. It appears we're having a bit of trouble with Billy's audio here. He will be redialing in um, in just a moment. So what I will do, um, I'll go ahead and uh, yeah. uh, kind of continue the conversation here, and then we can circle back around to Billy uh, here in just a minute. So one of the things that we need to uh, realize in our industry is that we're an incredibly fragmented healthcare system. So we all want to achieve big things, uh, but we believe we've got to figure out ways of breaking down these silos and figuring out ways that we can that we can work together. So we're going to go through and highlight here in a few minutes uh, what the Pulsera solution is, and we'll run through some examples of how our current communication solutions work versus what's the opportunity with Pulsera. What we'd like you to do is to think about how Pulsera can help you achieve your quadruple aim goals by really focusing on uniting care teams uh, that can cross different healthcare entities. And so really to, to kind of break that down, if you look at uh, a care team that needs to be surrounding a patient, especially for things like time sensitive emergencies or some of these complex cases, what we're trying to focus on is how do we get this physician in contact with this physician? That's often a difficult thing in real time to get these clinicians gathered together. And so what we're going to do is focus on uh, re uh, replacing all of these mixed technologies uh, with mobile technology. When we look at Pulsera and go through several cases, what we'll be doing is showing how step one, we create a dedicated patient channel for a specific event. This channel can be followed throughout the, the event by all healthcare entities. 
So step one is create that dedicated channel. Step two is you build your team. Uh, you can build your team by adding a new healthcare entity, like a new hospital or EMS agency. Uh, within a hospital, you can add a team, like a STEMI team, a stroke team, a trauma team, et cetera, or you can add an individual. And then step three is you communicate. So there are multiple opportunities for communication. Obviously, there's live audio, there's live video. So yes, this is a live video platform. There's also multiple opportunities uh, uh, like multimedia, uh, whether it's audio clips or photos, uh, things like that, and obviously team uh, messaging or chat. So those are the opportunities that we'll uh, be able to demonstrate here in a little bit. And so really our vision is we can cover an entire region, basically blanket an entire region with a communication solution where you can dynamically build your team and have opportunities for them to communicate. Uh, so uh, really what we mean by this is all EMS agencies and all acute care facilities can be on Pulsera. Uh, so we can manage all pre-hospital communication. In fact, our pre-hospital communication package is, is free. Uh, the other thing we can do is uh, assist all interfacility communications. So we can do this with or without uh, transfer centers. So basically help uh, the transfer centers identify uh, and link the providers together and now they have video opportunities. We also work very well for all time sense of emergencies. Anytime you need to quickly gather a team, your resources are scattered. Um, they're not all in one location so we can gather a team and manage that entire event where they all have uh, access to each other. So I think uh, we have uh, Billy on the line now. So we're gonna, I'm gonna hand the baton back over to him uh, and we'll get his perspective on some of the struggles and opportunities in his region. Okay, hey there, can you hear me now? Yes, sir. Okay, perfect, all right. So, so my apologies there, not certain where the uh, issues arise, but um, so, as, as I uh, have moved up to the career in, in EMS, I've taken a look and, and realized that we need to do a little bit better job at, uh, at managing data for us. Um, so something that's been done uh, much better in the, uh, inside the hospital area is looking at data and analyzing and doing studies and, and making better decisions as a result of those. And so that's something that we just traditionally have not done a really great job at in the pre-hospital setting. But in order to do that, you have to have really good data. Um, and so in my current role at the Georgia Trauma Commission, one of the things that was given to me was we need to be able to study um, trauma patients from the onset of injury to time that they actually get to definitive care. And, um, I, and I don't know, I'm certainly not saying that this is true for every single state in the nation, but what we've come to realize is that at best it's a very fragmented system. So we have, a, we have a patient that'll be transferred to maybe a rural facility. And then, uh, so you have two, two medical records there. You have the pre-hospital care report and the, then the, uh, record at the, at the rural facility. And then they get transferred by EMS to a, uh, you know, to a definitive care facility. So that adds at least two additional patient care reports at that time. And the problem that we're having is, is the, the ability to combine those and, and get a complete picture out of that. And so it's, it's like having a puzzle with a few pieces missing um, in that you're just not able to, uh, you know, to get a good uh, viewpoint of, what's, of what truly is happening. So, and, and while we would think that uh, we're doing a much better job of this with the computer-based reports, with the EPCRs, what we've come to realize is that that's actually the exact opposite. We're receiving less patient care reports at the hospital now than we did when we actually had printed patient care reports that people did by hand and left at the hospital, you know, 12, 15 years ago. Um, next slide, please, sir. Um, so other opportunities that we are looking at, um, it's also improved um, rural care. Um, how, do, how do we make that better? Uh, how do we make those things better? So again, in that type of area, you know, rural care, it's difficult um, due to, first of all, you, the cost. So you have a low population, and quite frequently um, in those lower population areas, they're also below poverty level. So you have, you know, low amount of patients who also have a very low payer mix, so that makes it very difficult. So, so what does that equate to for those patients? So they need to be transferred to a trauma center or a STEMI center or a stroke center, whatever, kind of, whatever the medical emergency is, which is typically going to be in a more urban setting, so it's going to be um, further away. So again, now you have EMS agencies who have less resources who are now required to transfer patients for a longer time frame, a longer distance to get them to definitive care. 
Um, so then at the same time, we're also still working on limits of communication. So we're either working with a radio system um, in which, you know, it's, it's, it's one way transmitting at a time, or they're, they are upgrading and using a cell phone with spotty coverage at times. So again, all of these are going to be concerns, but I also know that if I travel halfway around the world, I can FaceTime with my family at home and get to see my dog playing in the yard or doing whatever it is. So again, all of these are going to be issues. And then we look at the critical access facilities, hospitals in the, in the more rural areas. Again, they have a lack of resources. They have a lack of skill sets. And it's not due to the, the fact that they don't wish to do more. It's just that they don't have nearly the opportunities that you have in a more urban facility where you have a higher number of patients um, seen on a regular basis. These places still have the exact same needs for communications as we do with EMS. They're just sitting in a, uh, in a fixed facility rather than being out, uh, out on the streets. Um, and next slide, please, sir. And so then finally, something that, that we've also come across is um, I don't care whether you're doing STEMI, if you're doing strokes, if you're doing pediatrics, um, OB calls. Um, what we need in the, in the healthcare field, it, it, it basically goes across all of these different spectrums. Um, we need good data, and we need access to, uh, to opportunities, whether it's to communicate or access to equipment or just access to other information that we're unable to, to gain just from where we're at. And so it, the, the whole goal is that we can bridge the gap between each of these fields um, and, and get get us all on the same page, we're able to work with the same resources and basically have a, a higher level of efficiency because we're utilizing the same equipment for, the, for each of the groups. So James, that's where I was gonna leave it off to you and let you carry on, sir. Yes, sir, well actually we've just done that, so um, let's okay. go ahead and circle up and start with the inpatient stroke case. Okay, so guys, the, the, the goal now what we're going to do is refer to a couple of different cases and talk about how how there could be some opportunities for making some things uh, things a little bit better for our patients so one of the uh, one of the things we're looking at uh, one, one of the uh, cases we're looking at was an inpatient stroke case so basically a 79 year old male um, undergoing a, a battery change for his ICD implantable uh, cardioverted defibrillator um, at, at a great highly ranked medical center so again we're talking at a place that has all the capabilities all the assets and resources in order to do really good patient care. Um, patient has a history of AFib, was off of the Eliquis for three days, and uh, procedure went well, kept it overnight for observation. Again, something that's gonna happen pretty much at, at any type of facility. Um, the following day during the discharge process, he's noted to start having some confusion, a little bit of weakness, um, confusion progressed over the next 10 minutes, and then a rapid response team was called using the internal messaging service. Again, something that's typically gonna happen. So a single nurse arrives within 20 minutes, thought the confusion might be secondary to, to dehydration. So of course the message is then sent to the admitting physician. They, they take some precautions going down, that, going down that route. So over about the next hour, the patient becomes more confused. The family um, has, a, has a concern at this point about a possible stroke. So eventually now a stroke alert is called about an hour and a half into the symptom onset, um, the discovery of what's going on with this patient. So over about the next 15 to 20 minutes, of course, the stroke team arrives. You have the admitting cardiologist um, is now ordered, uh, notified to, to actually order the head CT, the head CT. and uh, the patient, uh, the order was finally received about two and a half hours after the symptom onset. Again, this is a very typical type thing for, a, for an inpatient type of event. So now the patient's transported to CT, becomes, becomes combative. This puts another... Uh, uh, a problem into the, uh, the scenario here. They're unable to reach the physician and end up aborting the CT attempt. Patient has moved to ICU and his consult is now placed to a hospitalist. So basically now at five and a half hours, the patient's evaluated by a physician, they're sedated, a CT is finally completed at six and a half hours post the symptom onset. So, so quite simply, this entire scenario, um, when they look at studies, you know, when we bring a, a patient into the ED from, from pre-hospital world, um, the door to CT time is typically 15 to 20 minutes. That's kind of a goal. But through multiple studies, what we've realized is that we do our worst patient care for these patients for people who are actually in the hospital and up in a floor. So we're looking for some opportunities to make this better. So James, what do you think here? Fantastic. Well, thanks, Billy. Um, so a lot of times we'll uh, come back to cases like this and we'll end up doing a root cause analysis. Uh, and I spent many years going to these meetings where we're focused on whether it's time sensitive emergencies or 
or other um, uh, scenarios where we have to break down, well, how did things go wrong? Where did things go wrong? So oftentimes uh, you can circle things around people, process, and technology. Obviously, when you go through that case, there's a whole bunch of things that are people and process related. But one of the things we want to focus on today really is the technology aspects. Because if you look at all of the missed opportunities uh, to intervene in this case and accelerate uh, a breakdown in communication and getting uh, uh, the urgent and emergent alerts to the right people at the right time, it's often a problem. And one of the things that I think that we need to, to realize is the variance and variability for communications that we have in our system. So we were talking about it a little, uh, a little bit earlier, um, but one of the problems that we have is every different method of arrival has a different uh, protocol. For example, if you look here on the screen, ED patients, inpatients, um, inbound EMS, interfacility transfers, we often, every different time sense of emergency has a different protocol, and every different method of arrival within those has a different protocol. If you just look at the frequency at which inpatient STEMIs and strokes are done uh, versus our EMS or ED walk-ins, uh, they're much, much lower. And so that really puts us behind the eight ball. And so one of the things that we believe is very important is that we need to reduce variance and variability within our system so that I can start a case as an ED patient. Uh, if somebody calls a radio report, I could start a case on their behalf, uh, or I could accept a patient from EMS, or I can start a case as an inpatient, say rapid response can start a case, uh, or I can go through the transfer center. All of these scenarios, I have one way to do my job for a time sense of emergency, which is really isolated to building a team uh, to solve a problem. And so that kind of brings us to the next step so we can obviously create a channel. Um, again, you'll hear me go through over and over again, this is how you create a channel, how you build a team, and then how you communicate. So that second piece of building a team, I think is very important. A lot of our cases, we think of kind of blammo, it's STEMI, blammo, there's our entire STEMI team, it's gonna be the same every time. We'll think about things like stroke or trauma. Uh, the case evolves and our needed resources might evolve. Uh, we struggle with who's on call, having to go through middlemen for the communication, whether it's the operator or the, the HUC or whoever it is. With something like Pulsera, it's as easy as a tap, so say in a stroke case, uh, uh, you determine that you need the interventionalist on call, what you can do is one tap, add the interventionalist on call, uh, and an alarm will go to them and bring them into this care team. Even more important is all the information that's been relayed is visible for everyone to, to see. Uh, another key thing that, that I wanna focus on, something like inpatient use of video. So imagine um, uh, how much effort we spend out in, in uh, the healthcare communications arena focusing on patient to physician live video telemedicine opportunities. Well, what is the, the potential of clinician to clinician? So not only do you know the individual clinicians that are on the care team, but one touch I can launch a video and actually show uh, what the patient looks like. So instead of a report over the phone, you can actually physically interact or, or visually interact with other clinicians, swivel the camera around to show the patient. So imagine in this scenario how you could use that, leverage that to elevate the priority of, of this case. You know, one of the other things that I'd like to comment on is alarm fatigue. We really struggle with alarm fatigue in, in the industry. Uh, there's a, a movie called The Incredibles that, that my daughter loves to watch over and over. And one of my favorite lines in that is where Dash's mom says uh, that everyone is special. And Dash replied, well, when everyone's special, that's just another way of saying that nobody's special. The, the same is true with your time sense of emergency or our emergent alerts. It's really hard to get that priority. One of the things that we found with Pulsera is when alerts go through this system, uh, people typically know that this is a time sense of emergency. This is something I need to stop what I'm doing and deal with right now. So those are a couple of examples of things that we could leverage a regional communication network to help solve. Uh, and I think it's important in our first case when we're talking about a regional communication network, we just talked about a problem within the four walls, uh, but it's something that this solution uh, can help and it helps standardize it across the entire, uh, the entire region. 
So I'll pass it back okay. over to Billy to review a, a trauma case now. Excellent. Perfect. So, uh, so you know, a, again, a, a big portion of this that people would like to know about is, is how this will help for the pre-hospital environment. So um, here in Georgia, we had a student at a high school wrestling match and, and suffered a really gruesome knee injury. So um, EMS, you know, is, is called. They arrive on scene, and during the splinting of it, um, it was a dislocated knee that, that self-reduced as they were splinting the uh, as they were splinting the knee. So as usual, EMS calls in a patient care report. It was over the radio. They had a really short ETA to the hospital. Uh, the physician happened to be walking by, heard the basic um, patient care report, and, you know, continued on with their duties. So, of course, the um, EMS arrives at the hospital. They do a patient uh, care or they, they transfer patient care over to the nurse. They never actually saw the physician. So everything happens as, long as it normally does. The physician does the, the, the x-ray of the knee, um, determined that there was basically a patella dislocation because he really thought that that is what he heard over the, uh, over the radio for this patient. So a patient has a splint applied. They're sent home. Later on that evening, the patient had actually taken the splint off and, and co began complaining of just a, a tremendous amount of, of, of pain again to the to the same location. So again, EMS comes back out, they, they assess the patient, they evaluate, and they place the splint back on, at which time the patient says, okay, well, I, I don't have any more pain. So at that point in time, a patient uh, refusal is obtained, and the patient's mother says, we'll take him to the orthopedist as scheduled tomorrow morning. Well, the following morning, it is realized that the patient has a really significant vascular compromise, um, the outcome of which the, the patient who was a teenager in high school ended up having to have a below-the-knee amputation of their, uh, of their leg at that time. So, again, a very um, significant injury for this patient. Um, James, what do you think about this one? Yeah, this is a very sad but a, a kind of a common problem that we struggle with in, in real-time communications, uh, and that is really message sent and message received. Sometimes they're not the same. Uh, other problems that we really uh, struggle with is the limitations of our current communication technologies. So oftentimes when we uh, hear something, we kind of start to fill in the blanks. Uh, and when you look at how we do communications in healthcare, especially EMS communications, uh, we typically do it twice at least. So we give a hear report or a radio report uh, to someone uh, at the hospital who's never going to take care of the patient. And then when we show up, we give a bedside report and oftentimes the ED physician or others aren't there. And so we often will lose uh, bits and pieces of communication in every single uh, transition or, or handoff. And so really one of the things that, that uh, we wanted to focus on with Pulsera is um, uh, real-time communication needs to be accessible and go to all downstream team members. So not just the synchronous communication, the live uh, audio uh, and video communications, but even asynchronous opportunities. So in this instance, uh, basically you can leave an audio clip where the medic can, can really specify this was a uh, knee dislocation, not a, uh, a patella dislocation, not a kneecap dislocation. Uh, and so that full report is not just available to the charge nurse who's uh, determining what room they go to, et cetera, uh, not just the handoff team, but if the, any ED physician or orthopedic person that follows on later in the case, they're able to hear what that initial report is. Of course, images, those will be available. Things like um, uh, free text fields where you can explicitly say things. So we've talked about uh, live audio and live video, but I think it's really important uh, about how we can leverage things like these audio clips or things like team messaging. Um, uh, we all know that like in a case like this, I've been on the physician side of things where it's difficult to get a good knee exam sometimes in, a, in an adolescent or a, a, a child. And the difference in the history of patella dislocation versus complete knee dislocation, where now they're guarding and resisting and uh, all that kind of stuff, those are very significant. And so you can even do things like confirmation after the, the case has been, after the medics have even left, potentially, uh, confirming that this is a, was a knee and not a patella dislocation. Correct, it's a knee dislocation. Uh, at that time, they had strong distal pulses. So these are some opportunities that, that we can look at and leverage from a regional communication network of focusing on uniting all care team members, 
not just bridging that uh, pre-hospital gap, uh, not just leveraging our uh, old uh, technologies, but moving people over to mobile technology and what opportunities that affords for real-time communication. So I'll pass it back over to you, Billy, for a stroke uh, interfacility facility uh, uh, conversation. Yeah, absolutely. So, let's, so I know we, uh, we discussed the stroke before, but that was one for a, a patient who was located inside of a major hospital. Uh, but so now let's talk about a, another patient. So you have EMS, they deliver a 69-year-old female patient to a rural hospital. It's about 8 o'clock at night, has, a, has acute onset of altered mental status. So upon evaluation, physician covering for the, for the ED at the time, is concerned that she may be having a stroke, but she has a normal CT, but calls the transfer center um, to the closest primary stroke facility. So, of course, the physician sits on holds for about 10 minutes while the uh, transfer center locates the on-call neuro doc. And, and you know, the, the patient, you know, their, their symptoms are continuing to grow at this time. So, after the transfer center connects the call, the neurologist asks multiple questions. You know, does the doctor do the doctor thing? Um, the physician thinks that the NIH uh, stroke scale is about a three. But there was an on, uh, acute onset of confusion. The patient's really upset, having problems communicating. Um, doesn't seem to be any other, you know, motor deficits or, or motor or other deficits. Um, EMS um, said that the, the, the patient's husband said that she normally takes care of him. Everything's good, but I'm un unable to get in touch with him at this moment. And, and again, that, that typically happens or, or it, it does occur. Let me just say it that way. So neurologist errs on the side of caution, accepts the transfer but is unable to, to rec uh, recommend thrombolytics just based upon what's being given and, and recognizes that the patient is about 45 minutes away. Well, we also know how well that works because while a patient may only be about 45 minutes away, they have to make sure that they have a bed after the physician receives. They have to make sure that, um, that they can get EMS to, to get there in a timely fashion and transfer the patient. So there's several different things that occur here. So, so three and a half hours later, the patient actually arrives and now they have an NIH um, stroke scale of 14, um, and, and it's just very obvious at this time that there's large middle cerebral arterial occlusion. Um, and so at this point, well, now the patient needs to be transferred to a comprehensive stroke center where they are currently at a primary stroke center. So, so this transfer really didn't benefit the patient, you know, much at all. Um, so there's just lots of questions involved here, you know. Why did it take so long to get the patient transported? Uh, when did the condition change? Why was there any communication in the change of condition? There are lots of different concerns here, but, um, but again, an everyday type of scenario that can occur for us. So, uh, so James, how do you go with this one? Yeah, this is another case that, that uh, I have uh, uh, been on both sides of the equation for. I, I think this is one of the uh, a great example of how difficult it is to unite clinicians across different healthcare entities. So I think it's important to look at, uh, at this scenario from multiple perspectives. One is the perspective of uh, interfacility communications from a, a spokes perspective. So oftentimes it's hard to get in contact with the accepting uh, physician uh, or clinicians. So uh, we may have a very streamlined uh, single phone number to call for an interfacility transfer. Uh, they may pick up right away, but it Sometimes it takes a long time that we're sitting there on hold uh, to actually find the clinician that we need to talk to at the hub uh, and then actually unite those. You know, other things uh, that we struggle with is oftentimes it takes so long to get the communication uh, through that we're just like, we just need to get this patient out of here. Uh, we need to get them to a higher level of care. There's nothing I can do for them. So anything that might slow that down, I want to prevent. Uh, and oftentimes we're not aware or the, the sending facility may not be aware of the impact of communicating this change uh, in, in condition. Uh, other things, uh, in this case, uh, the nurse may have actually, uh, on the nurse report at the, at the transfer, may have actually given the update, but it never got to the physician or to the stroke team at the hub. It just went nurse to nurse. Um, so other things that we need to look at are what about the hub perspective? So I've been on both sides of the equation. When I'm on the other side, sometimes I'm just shaking my head like, uh, did they not understand how to do an exam? Did they not get what was going on? Um, uh, is, it, is it a problem with skill set or knowledge or, or those type of things? And that, that may be unfair, uh, but that's some of the things that we often struggle with. Oftentimes at the hub, we don't understand all of the intric intricacies of what it takes 
to do inter-facility transport. So that EMS agency, it may take a truck out of service and leave an entire county uncovered uh, for hours. So mobilizing those resources sometimes takes time and communicating that back and having an avenue to communicate why there's a delay. When is the patient gonna actually show up? What's the ETA? We need to be able to open up channels of communication to, to uh, allow for those uh, conversations because it affects things on both sides of the equation. Uh, and that's not to mention the EMS perspective, which uh, they may not even know or have a full picture of uh, how the patient's symptoms evolved over time because of all the handoffs. Um, they may not uh, really know to do much else besides call report when they're 15 minutes out and give an update then because uh, they don't realize the, the, the changes in care, et cetera. And so kind of focused on, well, how, does, how can Pulsera help solve uh, or address some of these issues? I think it's important to really focus on the simplicity of creating a dedicated channel for an event, um, building a care team, and then allowing them all to communicate with each other. So it's super simple. If you look at the um, spoke facility, they can either request a transfer or a consult, select their destination facility. Uh, that then customizes uh, what pops up here, which are, are um, steps that the hub or the transfer center can establish where this is how we want you to quickly arrange a transfer or these are the things we wanna make sure are done. Once they're, they're connected, well, how does the transfer center add a care team member? Very simple, we've already kind of highlighted this in the past, like if I need a neurologist, one tap, you attach the neurologist and the person on call gets activated. Uh, as that care team evolves, um, say we know we need to add an interventionalist, one tap and I can add them in. Stroke team, one tap, I can add them in. Oh, there's a change in condition, I need to make sure this patient gets routed through CT for an emergent scan because this patient got TPA. Uh, we're concerned about a bleed, one tap, we can add them in. Uh, so I think one of the final things that I really wanna focus on is uh, once you have this dynamic team, we obviously have multiple, not just uh, departments within my own entity, but multiple different healthcare entities. So we can actually show every single healthcare entity involved, every EMS agency, every hospital, and their care teams will be listed. So not just the care teams, but the actual individuals, and if I need to do a live audio call or a live video call, whether it's within my organization or taking over to another healthcare uh, organization, it's one tap and I can open up video so I can have uh, these conversations. So I think we've got time for one more case. Uh, so Billy, let's look at uh, as this uh, STEMI case now. Excellent. So yeah, so for a STEMI case, I think that this is something that's, that, you know, basically we can all relate to. We've, we've probably all experienced one of the issues, one of the hardships that, that goes on in this case. So 6 a.m. on a Sunday morning, EMS arrives on scene. They have a 52-year-old male patient with chest pain. So um, EKG, they're looking at three millimeter depression and anterior leads. Um, they have some ST elevation in leads one and six. Um, the patient's uncomfortable. They're having a really hard time sitting still. So you're getting a, you're getting a really uh, unclean um, EKG there with, with the artifact. So EMS calls report, identifies the chest pain, uh, identifies the patient as having chest pain, and they describe the EKG. But for whatever reason, they're unable to, to, to transmit the EKG. Maybe they don't have the capabilities. Maybe it's not working for them at the moment, what, whatever it is. So upon arrival, there's no room ready. After a couple of minutes, the charge nurse told EMS that, you know, go to room 12. Um, there'll be someone there with you in a few moments. So, you know, they get down there, only registration that comes in. You know, they, they want to do the registration, which, which is incredibly important, but uh, isn't really going to help the patient with, their, with the STEMI at the moment. So, um, so after several minutes, EMS, they go back to the charge nurse to report this concern about the patient. Charge nurse pages the overhead, or pages the nurse overhead, you know, and so then a nurse and a tech enters the room while giving the report, you know, they do an EKG, the tech does the EKG, and, and they basically have the same findings. So then the emergency physician arrives about 20 minutes later after, after the door time, um, reviews, reviews the EKG, and now they call a STEMI. So now we're at 645. So remember, they, they arrived on scene with the patient at 6 a.m. So we're 45 minutes after EMS arrival, after first medical contact. So at 6.53, unit clerk launches the STEMI code protocol. So we're now in motion working on getting the patient taken care of. And then, of course, you know, the pages, the messages, everyone is sent out to the cath labs, the cardiologist, the overhead page, you know, all the things that come along with that. So then the cath lab arrives, um, notify the emergency department they're ready to receive the patient. 
Um, but, but, you know, cardiology, the cardiologists have not yet responded. So they begin the process, they call the cardiologist, and, um, you know, lo and behold, he calls back and, and responds, well, you know, he's not on call. He's at church more than 30 minutes away. And, you know, call changed at 7 a.m. And so, you know, now they need to figure out the other physician that's going to be going to be on call for this. So they contact the new cardiologist. They arrive after another 30 minutes. And so now the door to device time for this patient is 108 minutes. Um, so the, the first medical contact um, is, is 156 minutes. So patient outcome for this, due to the longevity of all this that's happening, is life, uh, lifelong congestive heart failure. So again, looking for a solution for this, James, what, what do you got for us? All right, yeah, this is, uh, this is one of these cases that, that really you have to reflect back on people, process, and technology. So obviously there are some people and process issues with a case like this. Uh, we've all seen and dealt with uh, the the 6:30 uh, a.m. STEMI or trauma or stroke case when call changes at at 7 a.m. So we all hate to receive those calls. How we deal with those, I think, is a uh, is a critical critical uh, issue, and that's a people and process thing. But there are even in those scenarios some technology things that we can do uh, to help. Uh, to, to help with those situations, help manage those situations. So as we're digging into the STEMI case, um, let's first talk about ECG transmission. You know, most regions have a solution for sharing pre-hospital ECGs. They're typically paid solutions. Um, oftentimes we have EG, ECGs floating all over the place with no name attached to it as it takes too, too long to enter that in. Uh, we often distribute them by blast email, fax, some of these web-based uh, solutions. So keep in mind, though, that nationally about 43% of all heart attacks, all STEMIs, present by EMS. Uh, and the rest of them are ED walk-ins, inpatients, inter-facility transfers. In hospitals, we often don't have a great solution uh, for these types of patients. So we end up taking a picture and sending it uh, by text or something like that uh, quite frequently. So at Pulsera, we really make things like this very simple. So you can either um, attach it from the cloud, from RescueNet, um, uh, or you can leverage the, the camera and send via a secure platform that actually has the name and other critical uh, details attached. Uh, so you can even add an old ECG for comparison if, if you have access to one of those because you now have uh, images like the driver's license so you can actually look up the uh, the old medical records and, and see if they have an old ECG for, uh, for comparison. So I think one of the other things that, that this case centers around on in, in the root cause analysis is, uh, is the call list. So um, getting the call uh, or the alerts to the right person on call is really a complex problem that needs a solution that's based on accountability, on transparency, on adaptability. You know, with Pulsera, every single team member knows who everyone else is. Uh, the other key thing that they know is who has responded to a case. So I don't know if you've ever sat through these meetings and heard the, the reason for delay of I didn't get my page. Well, those type of things are gone with Pulsera because in real time, uh, if you acknowledge your alert, which is a loud siren or a loud noise that keeps going off until you acknowledge it, um, uh, when you acknowledge your alert, you get a green check mark. So in real time, everyone knows uh, that you know about the case. In addition, uh, that information is stored for, um, for analysis afterwards, uh, in, which really helps you streamline your, your system of care. And so issues like that really, um, uh, or opportunities like that really help you even put pressure and uh, reorganize the people and process uh, opportunities that, that we all need to still lean in on. So the technology can be used to kind of help those situations. Other key things, we've, we've all been the, the, or a lot of us have been the cardiologist or the specialist on call who um, gets that uh, alarm uh, five minutes before we go off call, uh, or we're at a softball game or something like that, and uh, our partner's supposed to be covering for us, but they forgot to tell X, Y, and Z person that the call has changed. So we even have opportunities like if, if I'm on call and receive an alert, I can actually force the next person on call or push a notification to them. So like pagers, you can turn off and on. Um, with this, you can actually tag an individual to a case 
without going through all of these uh, different protocols and uh, like you have to wait for 15 minutes before you repage and then you do uh, this scenario next, then you call the, the, um, uh, the on-call uh, management system to alert the next person. All of those type of, of things go away now because we have complete accountability, transparency, and adaptability built within the system. So that first doctor could have with one touch just recognize it and say, I bet my partner will cover for me uh, for this uh, for this five minutes. They'll, they'll be ready and I can just push that call to them. So these are some great examples of opportunities to really uh, uh, help streamline uh, gathering the correct uh, care team uh, to surround this patient and help really reduce a lot of these delays that are, in, uh, that are inherent within our uh, systems when we leverage the current technologies that we're leveraging. So uh, what we'd like to do now is pause for a few minutes, and I believe we have some questions that are that have been uh, uh, piling in here. So we have a few minutes to answer a couple of questions. Thank you very much, James and Billy. You're right. We will now begin today's question and answer session. Audience members, please submit any questions you have by typing them into your control panel in the space labeled "Enter a Question for Staff." and clicking send. We will try to get through as many questions as we have time for. And there's lots of great feedback coming in today, and I want to pose a first question. A audience member is wondering, how much does Pulsera cost? Perfect. Well, I can take this one, Billy. So, um, so all pre-hospital communication uh, uh, or our pre-hospital communication package in a region is free. It is free to EMS and the hospitals, no hidden agenda. What that does is that allows us to unite the difficult parts of the equation from a, uh, a chicken and egg scenario of who goes first and we need buy-in and that kind of stuff. So we can provide all pre-hospital uh, communication for free in a region. Uh, and then hospitals have the option of purchasing um, uh, the in-hospital and uh, inter-facility communication components. Uh, that's an annual subscription, and currently our contracts average uh, between $2,500 and $3,000 a month, uh, and that includes unlimited users and includes uh, uh, the live video uh, portion of this as well. Excellent. Thank you for clarifying that, Dr. Woodson. And another audience member is wondering, what has been the greatest barrier of entry into the regional communication areas that you have targeted? Uh, yeah, I can I can take a first uh, stab at that, and then I'll uh, uh, let Billy answer that from his perspective as well, from a uh, from a state perspective of what would be what are the complications of, of starting to roll this out in a state. So really, the the main thing that we struggle with is tradition, uh, people understanding what is the opportunity for being able to unite all care team members and being able to dynamically build your team across healthcare entities. And so I think understanding and tradition are probably our biggest barriers. I think then, uh, because we are uniting multiple entities, it's gathering the entities together to have that conversation uh, so that they can see and evaluate what are the opportunities. Why does this help me as an EMS agency? Why does this help me as a hospital? And most importantly, how does this, us working together, actually help the patient, uh, help us achieve our quadruple aim uh, goals? Uh, and so I think that's probably the next, uh, the next hardest thing. So Billy, I, I'd uh, love to hear your perspective as well. And I would honestly just uh, just piggyback onto what you said is, you know, like in Georgia, we have 159 counties and 139 emergency departments. And it's getting everyone to realize that if we work truly together better as a system, it's going to improve patient care and make life better for all of us. And so it's just bringing everyone together to the table and recognizing that there is a, a benefit system wide as well as for each individual patient if we do have a true system where we're able to work together on it. Absolutely. Thanks for those fantastic answers. Someone is wondering, what major EHRs does Pulsera integrate with? Yes, um, I can take that one. Uh, so we have the ability to essentially integrate with any uh, EHR on the, on the market. Perfect. Short and sweet. And another audience member is wondering, who are your competitors? 
Sure, yeah, I will uh, answer that question. I'm actually gonna switch over to um, a slide here to kind of highlight that. Uh, so if you look at somebody that truly kind of uh, bridges the gap, so any method of arrival um, through the patient journey, uh, you're able to create a channel, build a team and, and communicate. Uh, we don't see a whole lot of people really patching all of that together. What people will often get confused on is, well, when do we use Pulsera versus other solutions that are, that are out there? Uh, uh, really what we focus on is within a facility, most uh, hospitals, uh, for example, will have their own solutions. Uh, and so people kind of struggle, well, when do you use Pulsera versus this solution? So pre-hospital inter-facility and um, time sense of emergencies are great examples of when you'd use Pulsera. In this space, you have the CCNC solutions. Uh, those are often um, driven by EHRs, so Epic, Cerner's, those type of entities will have solutions, and they're fantastic. Similarly, the, the uh, Doc Halo, Vocera, Volt, Spoke, um, uh, Tiger Connect, uh, those are all fantastic solutions, uh, but they focus within a silo. Uh, we've talked about for interfacility the uh, the, the uh, telemedicine solutions and the transfer centers. We don't compete with transfer centers. We help enable their communications. If you look at the technologies they use, it's, they're more logistics like bedboard management, et cetera. Uh, those are fantastic solutions as well, but they often don't uh, link uh, with video, for example, this uh, clinician crossing over to this clinician. I think finally in the pre-hospital space, we have EPCRs that are, are um, doing some electronic pre-hospital notifications. Uh, there are other companies like um, uh, Track EMS and Triage uh, that focus on pre-hospital communication. Again, that's the solution that we give away for free to open up um, the larger uh, problem that we're trying to, uh, trying to solve. Excellent. And actually, we have an audience member who is wondering a little bit more about Tiger Text. They have Tiger Text, and how much overlap is there between that and Pulsera? I see some differences, they say, but when do I use Pulsera instead of Tiger Text, or does this replace Tiger Text? Great question. Yeah, I'll, I'll take this one as well, Billy. Um, so, really, what uh, uh, Tiger Text or Tiger Connect is a great solution for within my four walls of the hospital. So focused on this slide here, if you're communicating about a patient within, uh, within the four walls, that's an excellent opportunity for, uh, for Tiger Connect. Uh, I think personally, every facility needs to have a solution that focuses within their four walls, uh, especially solutions that are highly integrated, uh, et cetera. And so uh, routine communications within a, um, uh, within a hospital or health system uh, is exactly when you should use Tiger uh, Connect. I personally don't believe we uh, really compete in that space. Uh, I think every facility needs a Tiger Connect or uh, a solution like that and a regional communication solution, which is Pulsera. Uh, and we can focus on all pre-hospital communication, assist with inner facility, uh, not just alerting uh, that there's a call that needs to be taken, but actually connecting an individual at the spoke facility who may be using Vocera or spoke or one of the other solutions with my provider at my facility. That's the case that Pulsera needs to be used instead of uh, Tiger Connect. So it's more of how can we work together rather than isolating one or the other. Excellent, thanks for really breaking that down there. And another audience member is wondering, do I have access to the data or does it go to my EHR? Yeah, uh, fantastic question. So uh, uh, two things. One is you can uh, move the data over to your uh, EHR if you want. Uh, a lot of our hospitals will keep the or will keep hospitals and EMS agencies will keep the data isolated because um, you have a a uh, web a dashboard a web based dashboard that you have access to 24/7 365, and you have the entire event. So picture this red line, you have all of the major data points uh, for that entire red line. Uh, and so if you're trying to fill out data for get with the guidelines or for some uh, accreditation body, you have access to all the data elements. 
and a lot of people will keep that data in a protected QI, QA environment. Uh, and so the C, some CIOs want the data in their EHR. Others prefer to keep their official medical legal record uh, with uh, data that they generate. Uh, and, but regardless, everyone has access 24-7, 365 to their own data, uh, into the, uh, all the data on that red line uh, in their dashboard. Absolutely, that's really helpful for understanding. And that looks like about all the time that we have time for today. Um, Billy or Dr. Woodson, do any of you have any final thoughts? Sure, my, my final thought is we, uh, we appreciate everybody joining us today. And if you'd like to learn more about Pulsera, please visit us at pulsera.com. Uh, you can see online uh, demo videos. Um, Better yet, you can connect with us um, either by filling out an online form or calling us, and we'd be happy to, to um, tell you more about our solution. Perfect. I'm good for myself. Great. Great. I want to thank you both, Billy and Dr. Woodson, for sharing your insights today and Paul Sarah for sponsoring today's web program. Um, please enjoy the rest of your day, and we look forward to having you join us for future webinars.